Welcome to episode seven of The Setting Trick. It's been a while since I've published an episode, so thank you to one of our listeners who messaged me over Facebook, getting me to get this episode out. Uh, Today, I'm going to be sharing with you my conversation with Samantha Punch. Not only does Sam play on the Scottish women's team, which just qualified for the Venice Cup for the first time, she is also a sociologist at the University of Stirling, and she is helping start the the, the academic study of the sociology of bridge. So... um, Without further ado, here's Sam. So if you could hire, like, let's say you could hire anybody to be on your bridge team for a major event, who would you, who would you choose? Who would be your partner, teammates? Yeah. It's hard because Big Bob is my bridge hero, Bob Hammond. Yeah. Um, But... He's what he's eighty now, isn't he? So yeah, he just turned eighty in August. Who else? So I've got to come up with four others. Tricky. Um, oh, Marion. Really? Yeah. Wow. I want a girl on the team. Okay. And well, she plays well with Zia, so yeah, Zia is my other favorite bridge book. So why don't I have my three top favorite bridge books? So that would be Bob at the table. It would be um, Zia, Bridge My Way, and it would be Sabine, Why I Love This Game. So uh, I'd have my three favorite bridge books. I'd have, who's the other one that I just mentioned? Marion. So I need one more. Oh. Mm. Mm. Andrew Robson, why not? Because I've got nobody, nobody from London. So how did you, how did you get a, how did you get you? So Bob is your bridge hero. How did you get a hold of at the table? Um, I was just at a bridge congress, which is like one of your regionals um, in Scotland years ago, and someone recommended it to me because I was asking everyone. I, was, I, I went through a phase of asking a lot of questions to a lot of people about bridge, and one of them was what your favorite bridge book was because I was on a mission to read a book every two weeks. Wow. Uh, and, um, yeah, someone suggested it, and they were right. It's definitely the best book, I think. Wow. So, for me, as a sociologist, it goes into the non-technical aspects of the game about how you manage yourself and your partner and emotions and stuff like that, and how you develop resilience and be mentally tough. I, you know, I noticed you did have a, you do have a lot of bridge books at your house, but to read <laughs> bridge books like two, a bridge book in two weeks, that's like bridge books are, can be kind of a slog. I think like they're like they're thick and dense. Um, so that's an impressive, uh, that's an impressive, can you give me some more? I read some thin ones as well. Yeah. <laughs> they weren't all thick. Did yeah, you read At the Table in two weeks? Oh, I think I read that in a couple of days. I couldn't put it down. Wow. Wow. Um, but this was when I was learning and I was really, really hungry to learn. So I, had, I made it, my New Year's resolution was to do that. And by the end of the year, I'd done it. So, yeah. So you I re- think it's, it's the only time I've ever kept a New Year's resolution. Really? And to read a British book every two weeks. So. I'm currently working through two bridge books, The Rodwell Files and Terence Reese. I think it's Play These Hands With Me. So. Yeah. I'm, uh, like, I live in, I live in Charlottesville, Virginia, and the, the, I, there's not great competition in the area. So for me, like a bridge book is kind of like how I can, like what you're saying, sharpen, use it as a way to, to sharpen my thinking. Yeah, I think you can accelerate a lot of how you play through reading. So if you wait for the hands to come up at the table, you're waiting a long time. Yeah. Um, I uh, So I, I went through your... Uh, results at the World Bridge Series and also at uh, the European Bridge Championships this summer. And 
I have to say that I'm impressed with how you guys qualified for the Venice Cup. But uh, you guys, like you all with like four or five rounds to go, you were not qualifying. And then you blitzed Norway and Portugal. Um, Norway, who was who was qualifying. I mean, that's like uh, talk about like Bob Hammond, you know, being at the table. That's really. Uh, I knew that was your goal because I I came to Sterling before the Europeans, and I know that your goal was to qualify for the Venice Cup. So what is what does it feel like to to have uh, like how, how many how many times have you played for Scotland in the Europeans, and like what is what is it like to to qualify in such a strong fashion? Um, well, I think I think I've been playing in the Europeans since two thousand and eight. So, in, in it's every two years. So every two years since then. Um, yeah, it's always it, it's actually our goal was just to be in the top ten because we'd never actually managed that before. Um, so we hadn't actually done that well in the Europeans. Um, I think there was various reasons for that, um, which I can go into if you want. But. Um, so our goal was initially to be in the top 10, and then we also benefited from the new rule that um, eight would qualify rather than six this year from Europe. Oh. Uh, so that that was in our favour as well. Um, and But we knew that although we were aiming for top 10, we knew if all three pairs were playing well, we could easily be in the top eight, uh, particularly because we'd had success um, prior to that in um, Poland in the in the equivalent of the Olympiad when we'd come forth. So we knew as a team that we could function and do well together. Um, but you never know whether everyone's all firing at the event at the same time. So, and fortunately we were, we started well. Um, we had a disappointing middle. There were some teams in the middle that we really expected to get some good results against. Um, so that was quite tough because, you know, we had, we had an idea in mind of the kind of points that we wanted to accumulate at certain points of the competition. And I knew we were quite a bit off schedule when we didn't get the better wins against the slightly weaker players that we should have done. It was actually the middle teams. I mean, we did all right against the weaker teams and we did okay against the strong teams. I think it's the middle teams that we didn't get as many as we might have got, as that you might have expected us to get. So um, that was tough. And when after we'd missed, we had a couple of easier days. And after we'd missed the boat there, I thought it was starting to look a really big challenge coming into the last day. Um but I knew we could still do it if we got if we got three decent wins. And I think on that last day, I mean, you're, you're maybe no better than me if you looked at the results, but I think we scored something like 47 out of 60. So um, we did have a good final day, um, but, but we needed it. I mean, I think we were lurking around qualifying anyway, but all the other teams lurking around qualifying also had a, a big last day. So we needed to have that big last day to, to really hold on to our position. So... So it was good, yeah. It was great. It was a great feeling. Well, being as how I visited you in Sterling, and I got to stay in the room where many of those bridge books are housed, um, it was exciting for me to see to see you like because I knew that you wanted to qualify for the Venice Cup. So I'm very happy uh, for you that uh, that you've managed to achieve this. Um, and it's amazing that Scotland has never been in even the top 10 in the Europeans. It was the 54th European uh, Championships I saw on the website. So that is, uh, that is a long time coming for, uh, for Scottish Bridge. Well, although you have to remember, because before it was um, Great Britain. Uh, Liz, for example, Liz McGowan, who plays on our, our current women's team, had previously played in, in fact, one uh, Venice Cup, I believe, um, when she played for Great Britain and um, I can't remember because it was before my time and um, because I came to Bridge relatively late I think it was around 2000 when Great Britain split up and the you know so Scotland uh, Ireland Wales England play as separate countries so I think it's only really been since about 2000 that Scotland's been trying to qualify gotcha and you started playing Bridge when you were finishing your PhD when I finished it yeah it was the the thing that I did to fill the gap of the PhD yeah I do, I'd I'd come across mini bridge earlier one time when I was traveling in Latin America. Um, I played mini bridge in Brazil quite randomly. And I just kind of made a note that one day, yeah, I wanted to learn the proper bridge. But that was when I was about 20. But I didn't actually get around to it till I was nearly 30. Um, but I think that's that that's something that stuck with me is that you can sow a seed with a potential new player. And it doesn't matter that they don't run with it straight away. 
if you've sown that seed and you've attracted them to the game, they might always return at any point. So it never worries me when we're trying to attract new players um, that people dip in and out of it because I'm often convinced that once they've tasted it, they will come back at some point in their lives. Well, you, I mean, you're sort of like, uh, you actually started Bridge much later than I did. And one of the laments that I have sometimes when I'm, uh, when I'm, when I'm bemoaning my lot in life is that I didn't, uh, is I didn't get to play junior bridge and I didn't get to play blah, blah, blah. And then I, I would be so much better if, if I had, uh, if I had done that. So I'm glad to, I'm glad to know that you're a late bloomer. Who, I mean, a late starter who has, uh, managed to do, to do quite well, um, in spite of that. Yeah, but I mean, I, I, I feel the same. And I think, um, was it Mo Joe that said that on one of your podcasts that um, he often tries to catch people a long time before they're getting close to retirement because he feels that um, you need to catch people younger because otherwise they'll always, once they've started, they'll always regret not having started earlier. Um, but some people would say that although I missed out on being a junior, sometimes my bidding's a bit like junior bidding. So I'm, <laughs> making up, I'm making up for lost time. So. <laughs> Well, I was gonna. Another question I wanted to ask you is: you you play with Stephen, who is your uh, is your is your life partner, and I wanted to know you played the entire Bridge series with him. Um, like, do you? How do you two? How do you two go over hands? Uh, how, do you have like a formal process uh, where you review like after the tournament's over, for example, or like what is your? Uh, what, how do you approach uh, improving and, and improving on bad results and good results? Yeah, we have a very serious structured approach to this. Um, we've thought about it long and hard. We basically go to the bar, I have a glass of wine, he has a pint of beer, and that's how we do it. <laughs> what about like if there's something that he did where you're like, I can't believe you did that? Like, how does how are you able to uh, to bring? to bring something like that. Are you just candid with each other? Uh, yeah, and sometimes a bit too candid. Um, and it's hard. It's really hard. It's something that we work at, and I think it's something that, you know, any couple um, that plays bridge, many many don't even attempt to or attempted to and have long since given up trying um, because it's not worth the grief. Um, it's very hard because it adds an additional layer of intensity. Um, I think really, you know, you should actually get a few more imps if you're playing in a couple because uh, it's much, it's a much harder game <laughs> than a, than a um, because you have the, the levels of emotions and the intensity and the, the temptation to say something you shouldn't is too great. And both of us can slip up. I probably slip up more than he does at that, particularly because um, I feel if I'm if I'm well rested and I'm not tired and I don't have much of work on my plate, then I'm much better at being a good partner. Yeah. But if I turn up to a tournament and I'm a bit frazzled because of work and I'm not sleeping as well as I could be, then I have less energy to devote to being a good partner. And that doesn't always come out well when I play with him, as you might imagine. Right. Um, so it's hard. I'm not, you know, I'm never going to pretend that that's easy, but we enjoy playing together. Um, and we have our heated debates and our, our spats and our moments, but um, we both work hard at trying to not hold a grudge and letting them go. Um, he's he is to be fair, he's a lot better at that, I think, than me. Um, <laughs> but I blame work. I blame the intensity of work on that, but, but it's possibly an excuse. So, can you give me an example of a of a hand or a situation uh, from Orlando where you felt like you like like he did something and you brought up like something that you shouldn't have? <laughs> yeah um i remember this very well because um we started okay um in the qualifying for the the mixed pairs um we started reasonably well and i had every confidence that we were going to easily qualify for the semi and our plan was to qualify for the finals um but our first session was good our second session was not quite so good and then our third session um we were struggling we were we were not necessarily playing our best we were getting some stuff wrong um but we expect to do that you know we're not we're not top players um we you know we are going to get more wrong um than the, the the very top players so um we can generally be accepting of some of that but there's times when both of us if either of us do something that we think the other ones it's way beyond their capability then it's hard 
And the one, I have two I have two issues that I struggle with, and that's when partner forgets a system because I think that's a really silly way to right. to lose symptoms because I think that's easily avoidable. You just read it and you learn it. It's boring, yes. It's tedious, yes. But it's an easy way to avoid chucking chucking imps um, or match points if it's pairs. Um, and the other thing I have a real problem with is kind of careless errors. Um, so I'll give you an example of this in that semi-final, trying to qualify for the semi-final. Um, it was against Roy and Sabine. Um, and he played the hand really well. And all he had to do was squeeze Roy. And all he had to do was play his diamonds, and the diamonds were all set up, and he called for a diamond from Dummy. So I knew it was, I knew that he didn't want to be just calling for a diamond. He needed to play the top one because then he was going to be stuck in his hand. But obediently, you know, as you do, you play the low one, he got stuck in his hand, and he now couldn't squeeze him. So instead of making 12 tricks, uh, I think he made nine for a complete zero. <laughs> um, and that cost us quali- that cost us qualifying. Oh my gosh! So that was hard to take because for me that was just a real silly lapse in concentration. You've called for the wrong card from Dummy, and I know we all do it. But yeah, yeah, a, yeah, yeah. He has a he has a slight tendency to do it. Well, we don't all do it. I don't. I don't think the very top players do it very often at all. And it's something that I work hard at. I, you know, check before I pull out a bid or before I pull out a card. Um, and I do that sort of thing maybe once every eighteen months. But he did it four times in that championship. Oh my god! He missorted his diamonds in with his hearts. He pulled a wrong card in another time, and he called for this wrong card in dummy. So I was fine because to me that's just lack of discipline. Yeah. Lack of, um, so I'm I'm I wasn't very um, I wasn't very supportive of that one. <laughs> Oh God! Now I'm sorry I brought this up. I'm like we're gonna. I'm gonna feel like we're piling on. Uh, we're, we're piling on Steve. No, but it goes. It goes the other way too. I mean, he can get very cross with me if I, you know, I can be ill-disciplined at times in the bidding, as people um, sometimes have accused me of. And he gets very cross if I do it. If I bid too much when I don't have, you know, what he's expecting. So he can get very cross back. So. We accept it's part of playing together and it's something that we have to deal with, but we try to leave it away, you know, so it's away from the table, but we don't always manage that. So what happened in this particular instance against Roy and Sabina? Like, what, did you jump him, like, right there at the table or, uh, like, uh, let me, let me, let me, let me give you, before, before I, before I let you know, let me, uh, so we played it, we played a hand against you, Roger and I played a hand against you in the open pairs qualifying, and I had a strong hand and I didn't really know how to bid the hand and Steven ended up I think it was yeah I think Steven ended up declaring a heart contract after I had bid diamonds and I Roger let a diamond and it was two small diamonds in the dummy and I had ace king fifth and Steven as it turned out had queen third and I also had the king of spades and there were two small spades in the dummy so I needed to win the king of diamonds and then play a spade that way uh, Stephen doesn't have the communication to uh, to pitch his. Uh, if I if if I if we play another round of diamonds, he can pitch his spade loser on the on the queen. Uh, but I just I just I I didn't really think about the possibility of my partner having the queen of spades, and I was sort of locked in on him having the queen of diamonds, and it's just like. Like this happened so often, particularly in the pairs, where it's like that one trick is, you know, the difference between good and bad. And it just like it was it's really difficult. Like it's really difficult to to get beyond to get beyond those type of sort of like uh, amateur errors. Let's let's uh, let's call it that. Um, So uh, anyway. Back to you. I, I just wanted to to bring that up as a as a as so that uh, I don't know why I wanted to bring it up. I mean, I think it's also interesting that we also have um, different tolerances for certain kinds of errors. So, as I said, for me, I I, I find it harder to take um, system errors or very careless mechanical errors because I think they're unnecessary. They're easily avoidable. Whereas, you know, other players could get really cross if their partner you know, misdefends or misplays a hand or so I think, you know, we all have our weak spots and I think it's linked to 
um, our own strengths as a player um, and our expectations of ourselves and of our partners. And I think it's quite interesting um, how it gets played out and how people have different different things that irritate them, basically. <laughs> so what happened in, the, in this... Uh... In this instance, like what 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 did you end up doing to uh, like to 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 bring your like frustration to light? How did you how did you choose to uh, to do that? Well, the problem with pairs um, is that you know you're playing whatever it was two board rounds. Um, right, so right. You have to get up and then walk to the next table, and you're, you know <laughs> so it's very hard in that you know. So, I, you know, I, I I can't even remember what I said. But I, I would have said something probably not too complimentary. Um, <laughs> but I mean, you know, and and I know it doesn't help. Um, but um, you know, and 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 pay, maybe as a result of that, it wasn't just his error. You know, that that led us to not qualifying. It could be then that he's then cross with me because I've said something, and you know, that's taken off his concentration off another board. You only need to take your eye off the board a tiny bit to you know to lose some more match points. So. You know, so I've got I've got to work harder at keeping my mouth shut, no matter what goes on. Well, obviously. you know, and, it's and, like and vice versa. It's like what it's like what Bob says in his book, or what Bob says in general. It's just like you know, you gotta move on to the next hand. But it's so it's so much easier to 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 say it. It's like practice what you preach. You know, like to, to actually be able to do it is uh, I think that's uh, it's incredibly challenging uh, to 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 just I mean, especially. When you do something or when I do something stupid, um, it's hard for me. It's hard for me to get past it. It's hard for me not to bring it up and say sorry. Um, but I feel like I feel like the best players probably they don't they don't make as many uh, elementary mistakes as I do. So that's not so much of a problem. But uh, I, I don't I don't know. There's the that's one of the one of the incredible challenges of bridge is trying to trying to be a, a good partner. Yeah, and I think I think it's it's you know I think all players make levels like mistakes that at their level that they shouldn't be making. So even top players do that and will be disappointed at themselves and their partners. But I think they work very hard and practice very hard at at controlling that interaction. Um, and they're, you know, particularly if they're full-time professional players, they're turning up fresh, they're less tired, they they can devote all their energy and efforts into being a, the best partner and getting the best out of their partners and managing those um, kind of emotions, not letting um, small things get to them. So that's my my view anyway. It may or may not be the case. <laughs> you guys did really well in the qualifying for the uh, open teams. Uh, you finished ahead of us. Yeah. Um, yeah, we were seventh. <laughs> you got to pick your opponent. Yeah, <laughs> the curse. <laughs> did curse you? Were you? Were you? Were you sure of the opponent that you picked? Like, were, did you? How much uh, research did you do into your into your uh, into your opponent? <laughs> well, we played them in the uh, uh-huh. qualifying round, and we'd beaten them nineteen one. Ah. And you know, we thought, well. We could do that again, um, but you know, when we got to the next day, they were playing well. We weren't. They got stuff right. We didn't. And suddenly, you know, it doesn't matter how well you've played for the two days of the qualifying. Finishing seventh suddenly means nothing when you're right. knocked out the next round. Yeah. So that's painful, you know, because you feel you've wasted. You've wasted a lot of your good play only to go along and then not play so well the next day and it to immediately be over. I know. I know. I saw they bid six diamonds against you in the. Uh, yeah, that was harsh. <laughs> in the first set that you played, that was a tough bidding. That was a tough bidding problem. I ha- I held the strong hand, and mm. I uh, I did not consider diamonds as a contract until after after the round. In fact, when I was talking to my partner about it, and I mean, even after seeing the dummy, I didn't even think of diamonds as a contract. So uh, it was a seven-two diamond fit. Uh, and I had, I'm just saying this for our listeners. I had seven, I was two, seven, two, two. And my partner opened the bidding a diamond at ace and one, ace, king, seventh, king and one, ace and one. And six diamonds was the winner. I, I ended up just forcing to six hearts. 
and going down. Fortunately, they went down in six diamonds at the other table, so that wasn't how we lost that match. But uh, it certainly we could have gotten a lot more imps had I had I considered an alternate they, alternate they contract. Three diamonds. They opened three diamonds. So at, at our table, yeah, it's kind of interesting that instead of opening one diamond, they open a preempt and get to the diamond slam. So whereas our teammates had opened. Uh, one diamond and got to four hearts. So. <laughs> 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 so our teammates thought they'd had a good auction because they'd stayed in four hearts. And like you, they hadn't quite appreciated at the time that six diamonds was rolling in. Sweet. Right? Did uh, did your did the opponents bid? Because my I got a one I got a one spade overcall after my partner opened a diamond. I don't know. Uh, I don't know what the bidding exactly right. was at their table. I try not to ask too much of <laughs> my teammates, um, you know, what things, when things have not gone well. So it's not, it's not tactic, tactical, is it? No, that's like the loose Dansby rule to, uh, to not ask about your teammates' results. It's uh, mm-hmm. another one of those things that's well, good to, to, for them to, to practice. Tell <laughs> right, right. So that I was surprised though when the the, the mixed up didn't end up being your team for the uh, for the actual mixed. I know that was a shame because that w- was a great mixed team, but unfortunately both of the pairs that we played with already had prior um, commitments to other teammates. So mm. yeah, so that's why we had the uh, cope with punch combination for the mixed. How did you end up playing with uh, with the mixed up group originally? Um, just because um, I've been to quite a few nationals over the years. I mean, for a period, um, I tried to go at least once a year to the States. Yeah. Um, and nobody much tends to go from Scotland. Um, occasionally, another pair might go. But um, often, we're you know trying to find teammates for um, different events when we get there. And because we've been quite a lot on and off, um, you know, playing particularly in the knockouts you end up playing against people of similar standards so I think we played against the Sprungs quite a lot mm. and we got to know them and then we played with them in Lyon was it last year for the um whatever event it was in Lyon the transnationals that was it yes that's right so they came so they that was the first time we teamed up with them um and then we teamed up with them again this time so Yeah, but it's hard. It's hard finding teammates sometimes um, sure. in Scotland because there's not so many other pairs that want to travel as much to play as we do, and we like to challenge ourselves wherever um, we go, and we're not afraid to get beaten up in the process of trying to get better. Did you have a? Do you have a favorite hand? Uh, maybe a play hand or a, a defended defending hand from uh, from Orlando that uh, you want to share? Oh, too much has gone on since then. It already feels like a long time ago. So there's one thing about, you know, working quite a lot and working long hours at work that hands come and go. And uh, so, yeah, I'd have to think about it before one emerged. Mm. Um, yeah, I in the first set that we, pl- that we played in the Open, uh, I got the six spades and I had, uh, I had to finesse for the queen. I had a I had a top loser in diamonds and I had to finesse for the Queen of Spades. And my left hand opponent had preempted. So that's uh that was that was exciting to to be in a contract when and and it was kinda like it, it had kind of been like I had talked to Roger about a hand from the youth tournament and I had nine trumps. Um but like when that Jack of Spades held the second round, um that was pretty sweet. <laughs> not sure if that uh, brings you... back any memories for you oh sorry no was I supposed to be thinking up one no 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 no, no. I mean just I just, just like I'm bragging on myself like we ended up getting we ended up losing the round pretty badly we actually we actually in the open teams we won the first match and then Roger and I played the next two Anyway, we lost the next two, maybe even the next three, and then we won all five of our matches on day two to qualify ninth. So that was uh, that was pretty cool. And what happened after that then? So uh, yeah, we lost on the first day. We picked a team that had a uh, 
I recognized the name of one of the players on the team, but it turned out he was actually a friend of mine. I just his name is Svenny, and I didn't uh, realize that that was how he spelled his name. Oh dear. A team maybe, and uh, and they trounced us. They they beat us by forty in the first on, in the round of sixty four. But the mixed teams, we did quite well. We got to the uh, we got to the quarterfinals of that. No, it was good. Good. Well, you, we lost. We lost to the eventual winners. So I saw that. I don't know. People say that that's you should feel better, but I'm not sure. It it never feels good to to lose, especially not when it was just by eight attempts. So. Oh, was it really? Yeah, there was too many. There was too many boards that we could have covered eight attempts on. But. Right. Well, that's a that's a good uh, you know Michael Rosenberg uh, um, is 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 a great player and so is Debbie and uh, the rest of the the rest of that team is from is from my part of uh, the states so it's exciting to see uh, all of them uh, win a world championship it makes it it makes it feel a little more attainable for someone someone like me. Yeah, I had some quite interesting conversations with Beth Palmer in the bar afterwards and I went over to congratulate her so uh, I was asking about her because I, I, um, I find it quite admirable that she manages to play bridge work and have children so or have a child um, I think it's very hard for women to do all three and she's managed it so her secret though was um, she felt that she could do it because um, she was already a successful bridge player before she had her child so mm. I think if you're trying to have children as at the same time as trying to become a top bridge player, I think then that's very hard, mm. as well as having a career. So, gotcha. To some, to a greater and greater extent. I've been trying to get uh, funding for a PhD for a number of years now, um, and it finally happened. So, um, yeah, I think it's really exciting. It's the first ever doctoral study of bridge. And what is he studying exactly? So the title of the PhD is Bridging the Gap, uh, an Exploration of Transitions in Play Through the Life Course. So what that means is he's looking at really what helps and hinders learning the game. So it's very much a project that's with um, ordinary um, players, not, you know, I've, I've done some research with top players, but this is with uh, players of all um, standards, abilities, of all ages. Um, and he's looking at what motivates them to, to take up the game. Because I think in order to keep, in order to make the game sustainable, we need to really understand what currently attracts people to it, and why they play. Yeah. And he's also looking at why people aren't attracted to it and why they don't choose not to take up the game. Uh, he's also looking at how um, people transit in and out of bridge throughout the life course at different stages. So they may drop out for a while and then come back, um, but also different transitions. So, for example, this is what the, the key funder, there's several funders involved in this. Um, the key funder um, is EBED, which is the English Bridge Education Development um, Organization in uh, England. Um, and they're interested in what helps and hinders learning so that they can develop resources um, to um, attract people to the game and get them to stay in the game. And their view is very much that often we teach people to play, but then they don't transition into club play. And then even if they do club play, they don't always transition into tournament play. So if we want the game to become really vibrant and sustainable, we need to understand what helps and hinders those transitions. Uh, but the other funders also um, are the University of Stirling and the other UK Bridge Unions. So we're really lucky to have um, got that funding because it's the equivalent of about $90,000 wow. to do a three-year PhD. So it's quite a lot of money. And and how is, has he started to uh, look into these specific questions about like what it is, uh, what what motivates people to learn? Well, I mean, he's only just started. So he started on the 1st of October. Um, so um, one of the first... While you were in Orlando. <laughs> yes. But there's a co There's two co-supervisors, one from eBed and another, um, Louise McCabe, who's um, a senior lecturer in uh, dementia studies here. So she's looking at um, the other end of the life course, whereas my, some of my key research interests are with children, young people, whereas she's... Um, her, key interest is with older people so between us we cover the life course um so she met with him when I was away um and then since then he's been he's just had ethical clearance so that he can do um his field work with the new university bridge club that we've set up 
So he's going to be a participant observer. So as we've just set up the new bridge club, he's going to learn alongside the players um, and he will be taking notes and talking to them and asking them about what made them come along to the club and what entices them back each week. And um, yeah, and hopefully there'll be a lot of lessons learned there about how you set up a new club and what works and what's less successful. And right. uh, we can share that more broadly um, as required. How many people do you have showing up for the for the university club? We get about thirty each week. Um, thirty, which thirty, yeah. Wow. Which given given competing competing things on people's agendas, we're quite pleased with that. It's not always the same people. We have a core of those that that keep coming back, but some people dip in and out. But as I've said before, for me, it doesn't matter if people dip in and out because even if you've even if you've sowed that seed of, of interest, uh, as I said, I think, you know, even if they they think, oh, I'll, I'll come back to that when I've got a bit more time, then I don't see that as a failure. Wow. How did you, how do you, I mean, like, how do you, how did you get 30 people to show up? Or how do you get 30 people to show up? That's amazing. I'm, I'm, I'm impressed. Well, it's a great team effort. I mean, I'm really lucky to work with some um, amazing people here at Sterling. Um, and I think that's one of the advantages as well of being having been here at Sterling University for 20 years. Um, so um, Pushpa, has she's a PhD student who, not a, my PhD student, but a PhD student in another faculty who heard me talking about Bridge. Um, and she's the president, and so she, she's the sort of driving force behind it. Gotcha. But we also have uh, two undergraduate students here, Ronan and Callum, who both represent Scotland, um, so they can um, they can encourage the undergraduate population to come. She can encourage the postgraduate population to come, and I um, work on the staff. So we're we're making it truly um, intergenerational, right. um, and we're, we've actually attracted and we've encouraged people to bring their children and grandchildren. So so far, we've had players from as young as I think eight to about seventy eight. Wow. So we're keeping it open to the, the local community as well. So the bridging the gap is not just between students and staff, but between uh, the university and the local community. Right. And how often are you are you all meeting? At the moment, just once a week for two hours. Wow. Um, but they they just sent me an email today actually saying that um, what we have lots of volunteers that come along and help. Um, so, for example, Stephen... Um, comes along each week. Liz yeah. McGowan, who I talked about on our women's team, she comes through from Edinburgh each week just to help out. Wow. So each table has uh, a helper at the table. So we have a teacher um, who does the overview at the beginning and then each table plays the set hands. And having that, that helper at the table is really beneficial in answering questions and really making sure that whatever the lesson is for that week is being properly understood. So are you the person who is charged with coming up with the lessons and the hands and all that stuff? Or who's doing no, that? No, I, uh, that's one reason why I haven't got around to starting a university bridge club until now, because I just wouldn't have the time to do that, not with the amount I work and the amount I play bridge. So um, we managed to get a small grant via the Scottish Bridge Union, which was also via the European Bridge League. Um, they had they gave some money to Scotland to help promote the game in Scotland, and Scotland agreed to give um, give us a small grant to enable us to pay a professional teacher. Mm. Douglas Robertson, um, it's Douglas Piper, sorry, Douglas Piper from Edinburgh comes through and teaches. So we have we pay him for his time, but everybody else is volunteers. Mm. Well. I, I, I mean, I remember I met I met, uh, I met the, the young woman who's the PhD student in uh, when I was in Sterling for the screening. Yeah. So, but Ronan did not show up. I remember that. <laughs> yes, but he's been great. Uh, he comes <laughs> along and he's a great teacher. You know, as a as a helper at the teacher, his his new pupils are very impressed with the way he can. Um, teach the game and make it very accessible. I think that's important is that you need, you need people who can explain it in simple terms um, as well as make it fun. So, and he's, he's really great at attracting people his age. You know, I'm a bit, I'm a bit old to attract the younger undergraduates along. So we need, we need a, a, a team of people of different ages to attract different ages to the club. I saw you sitting down at the, table in Orlando where they were showing hool did you did you buy a hool set I was very tempted um 
but um, I thought, you know, what's the point in just buying one set? I'd actually need to buy several sets, and then that was a bigger commitment. And um, I think we've got enough on our plate with just trying to teach, do, you know, do, you know, see through the lessons that we've already got arranged. So right. I didn't, but it looked interesting and fun. You played it though, didn't you? Yeah, yeah, it was it was fun, certainly. I, mean, um, I definitely think that you know you do need a bit of a grasp of some of the basics in order to be able to play it. So. And certainly the bidding, you need to know about how to make a bid. So, um, you know. I loved it. I think it's amazing. I'm, I, I teach bridge some uh, here locally, and I'm so excited to, to share that with people. Because the, the thing is, it's like you can get across what's important about your hand, but the bidding, there's so much minutia involved in the bidding that uh, just, it's. I mean, I, I realize that it, I mean, I, I'm, I'm interested in it as like a, as like just playing it. Like it's kind of an interesting, uh, like if you're not going to be declaring the hand and you realize that early enough, you want to give away is you, you have to, t I think you have to share information. So you want to actually share like whatever is like the least, like the, it's least helpful to the opponents. <laughs> yeah, true. Yeah, I mean, I found it quite fun too. So I was, I did, I did probably mean to buy one, but, um, I didn't get around to it. But. but I mean, the other good thing that we found about uh, Bridge Club, which um, has appealed um, to me in terms of um, more research perhaps in this area, is um, we have one of our PhD students brings two of her children. Um, and bet between them, what her son can't make the lessons. So between them, with her three other children, they're they're all playing at home now. So wow. the two children that are going to the lessons are teaching the son, and so they've got a four, and they play. And she's just really highlighted to me um, how we should really be targeting families right. as well. Yeah. You know, family approaches is encouraging families to take up bridge together because she talks about, you know, sometimes at the weekend they'll have pizza and then they'll play bridge, and she feels it's almost like they've had a sort of night out together because they've all come together and they've right. had lots of fun and... Um, and particularly because these are, you know, these are older children. These are, you know, um, older teenagers. Some are, I think, are even early 20s. So they don't o often get to do stuff like that sure. together anymore. And she's found it excellent for sort of having family bonding sessions. So I think there's, there's work that could be done there with attracting families to the game rather than just thinking about particular age groups. I, I am 100% in agreement with you. I have I have a friend who watched Double Dummy in February, and she's a she's a working mother, and her husband works, and they've got uh, I'm not sure how many children they have, but she said afterwards I saw her at a at a party, and she said I want to learn how to play bridge, <clears throat> and her husband said you don't have time, and it's like it's the perfect, like to learn it with your family. It's like the perfect way to learn. Cause then it's like, you make time for that. And not only that, but it's, it's a great way to spend quality time with, with your family. I mean, that's how, I, that's how I grew up playing cards was, was it was always something we did after dinner at the table. And I'm just thrilled to hear um, that you're having this sort of outcome over in Sterling. I mean, that is like so exciting. Yeah. And I think, yeah, we, we we need to think about how we can market that and sell that more broadly to attract others. I agree. I mean, I, I had a, at the same screening, my friend brought his 11 year old son and, uh, they, they announced that they were going to be doing bridge lessons, beginner bridge lessons, uh, in Charlottesville a couple of weeks, starting a couple of weeks afterwards. And he looked at his dad and he said, can we go? I mean, that's like, I mean, I, you know, like I, having made this movie and I know that when I came over to Sterling, you said that like one of the outcomes of the, uh, of the screening that you all did there was that the university bridge club had started. So the fact that, th that these kids are with their parents and they're teaching their younger siblings bridge as, as a result of that, like I really, it makes it worth it because the film has not been, it's not been successful in the way that I anticipated it would be when I started making it. And that, that is a source of frustration for me. So I'm really grateful for you that you took the time to not only screen it at Sterling, but make it a success. 
and fill the theater. But not only that, but you're taking the the impact of that screening and it's extending well beyond just one night. And that's like, that makes me so happy because I, I am frustrated about the film being sort of languishing away. And I, and I'm, a, I'm a, a lot of that responsibility for that lies on my shoulders, but it is nice when somebody picks it up and runs with it. Like, like, like you did in Sterling. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, I know you're, you're often asking about what, what else you could do with it um, to have it used more broadly. Um, and I think um, you could think about how it could be used more in this kind of way, um, linking it to university clubs, um, either to um, existing university clubs or to encourage a new club to start up. Because university bridge clubs, I don't know if you have them much in the States, but certainly the ones here in the UK that they're notoriously difficult to sustain because it's very much dependent, as I've talked about before, it's dependent on individuals that drive them. Mm. Um, and you really need a team of individuals, you know, at, as I said before, at undergraduate, postgraduate, and at staff level to make them really successful, I think. Um, but you could use the film as a vehicle to get interest and to get engagement and to encourage people to come along, either to an existing club and do it in Freshers' Week to encourage new new undergraduates who have just turned up to start their their university degrees or, you know, as a way to start up a new new university club. Yeah, that's a that's a good reminder. There's a young man who uh who that I've worked with in the past about that and he's somebody that I I'm gonna reach out to after after you and I are, are finished speaking, who uh who's in the film actually, Arjun Deer. He uh he's on the USA two team in uh in Double Dummy. And he has he had told me that he was he could get, he was going to get all the clubs that do participate in the collegiate tournament in the U.S. to screen the film. So I'm going to follow back up with him on that and see if I can't uh, can't take your advice. Yeah, because I mean it could easily be shown in you know big lecture theaters often have big screens, and you could just do it by you know using the DVD. Right. Uh, but you'd have to I think you'd have to consider. Um, having um, screenings with smaller audiences, but right. much more often. So the same could be done with schools. So, for example, I know that um, we have seven districts in Scotland, um, and some of the districts that um, were are at a distance in the Highlands, for example, were quite jealous of the film screening because they wanted to be involved. Right. Um, they said, well, couldn't, couldn't each district have a DVD? And then, um, because a lot of the districts work with children and young people in schools, and then they could take it into schools and show it to small groups of school children. You could even, you know, it could still be an event, because I know you're keen for it to still have that event feel about it, where maybe then it's shown after school, people are encouraged to bring siblings or parents or grandparents, um, and an event is made out of it, but it's a smaller audience, um, and you maybe aim for sort of 20, 30 people at a time instead of 100 plus mm. in a big you know, in a big cinema. And I think, you know, and you might also have to lapse the fee and see it as a non-money-making venture, but right. I think that would be one way of um, getting it to sort of promote children and young people and universities to play more bridge. Yeah, at this point, I don't even know if I care that it's an event anymore. I just kind of want to, like, divorce myself from this process. It's just so, like... <laughs> It's not, uh, you know, we're, we we didn't go to the Academy Awards. Uh, we got into one film festival. Um, am I sounding like a, am I, am I, is my complaining grating on you? <laughs> I think, I, you know, I, I think maybe you expected too much too soon. Do you know what I mean? I mean, yeah. it's small steps with these things. It takes time. Um, so hang in there and I think just try different approaches. Try, you know, more frequent events, smaller audiences, um, enable people to, you know, take it into schools right. and show it in different different kinds of, um, you know, environments. Like we and I think you'll get great feedback because it is a good film and it shows a different side to the game that people haven't seen before and it, it really feeds into, um, you know, what people are trying to do these days about shifting the image of Bridge as a game only for older people in retirement um, mm -hmm. and I think, it, you know, it shows that beautifully. We actually, like, the film is available for secondary schools for, for like, they can purchase it for screening for $75 
but that might even be too much. I, I don't, uh, I mean, I, I, I do like sort of want to recoup some money from the damn thing, but, uh, I don't know. I, uh, have you played bridge since you got back from, uh, Orlando? Uh, yes, we had um, a Gold Cup match, which is like the UK sort of knockout event. We had that on Sunday, so but we won quite comfortably, so that was okay. Who did you play? Uh, it was another Scottish team. It was an early round, so we would have been disappointed not to win. Was it in somewhere in Scotland then? In Edinburgh, yeah. Gotcha. How many boards? Oh, it, it, it's, it's the first round, so I think it was only 32, so... Yeah. So, I mean, it, so that's why, you know, even though you might expect to win, you don't always if it's only 32 boards. Right. And then this this weekend, we've got, um, like, probably the equivalent of you call them... We call them congresses, you call them sectionals. Mm. Um, although our sectional, I mean, this weekend, it's actually our national sectional because uh, Scotland's small, so it's our national um, event. So, yeah, we hoping to do well and then the weekend after that we have our national trials so Stephen and I are playing in the trials to try and get in the UK open event the cameras Uh, we have high hopes but our high hopes have been dashed before (laughs) what do you do what do you and Stephen do for training other than playing we do bid hands I mean we are very sad Um, we will take hands to bid we'll go to the pub and bid hands in the pub (laughs) Um, if we do ever, on the rare occasions we manage to have a non-bridge holiday, which is very rare, we yeah. take bridge hands with us, um, and that's what we do in the evenings for our entertainment. So quite sad, really. If you go to the pub in Sterling, for example, do you tend to meet up with other bridge players there, or you just go, the two of you, and you bring hands with you and then meet it, run into whoever? Yeah, I mean, there's not so many bridge players that we socialise with in Sterling okay. because we play more in Edinburgh and Glasgow now. Um, so, yeah, it will just be the two of us taking bridge hands and bidding and trying not to argue too much as we have more beer and wine. <laughs> the heated debates get a little bit more intense as the evening progresses. Uh, <laughs> but that's allegedly fun. Allegedly fun? <laughs> No, it is. We do. We enjoy bidding hands. We yeah. do. We enjoy bidding hands and talking about how, you know, and that's where I suppose, um, you know, I can get frustrated when we have a, you know, a bidding misunderstanding that, you know, just seems a shame when we do bid a lot of hands and that should be one of our strengths. So. Right. Where do you get the hands from? Uh, you know, you just, you have, I don't know what's, what's called, deal master or something. Um, he he sets them up. I can't remember what it's called. Deep, is it deep finesse or something? The, the program that you can just deal hands. And you can just put in certain parameters. So you can choose whether you want to do slam bidding or game bidding or whatever. Oh, I don't. I'm not familiar with this application. Well, and then you just print them out. So you just get north hands and south hands uh, se- separately, gotcha. and then you get both hands together. So we bid we bid a, we bid say tens, and then we go through them and look at what what whether we got to the right spot. I see. So, is there competitive? Can can there be comp- competitive bidding? Uh... No, that's no, that's the only problem. So, there's none. Yeah, there's none of that. Gotcha. My key passion at the moment is um, trying to establish the sociology of bridge as a new academic field because it doesn't current, it doesn't exist currently. Oh. So um, we have different projects um, that are going on again with EBED, English Bridge Education Development. I've been looking at uh, well-being and bridge. Um, I'm currently got a project on the benefits of bridge. Um, I've done um, the ver- the very first thing I did, I suppose, to kick all of this off was um, 52 interviews with elite players in the US and <sighs> in the UK. Um, nice number. So- well, uh, Sabine, it was Sabine that told me that I should stop at that number, <laughs> the number to stop at. But unfortunately, there are a few more people I would quite like to interview. So I'm not sure if I will manage to stop at that number. But, <laughs> but having said that, you know, I've enjoyed all of them. They've all been very different. Um, they've all been fascinating. Um, you know, everyone loves to talk about bridge. So there's now a wealth of data that I've got sitting there that's all ready to be analysed and written up. So my current project is to try and get small bits of funding 
to enable um, me to work with um, PhD researchers that can can work on it part time and help to analyze and write up that data. And because I think what's needed in order to establish a new academic field, you have to get credibility. Yeah. So. Um, in order to do that, you need to show that you have the expertise, and the way of doing that is to publish, uh, you know, academic papers in peer-reviewed, um, top-quality journals. Um, but that, you know, it takes time and money. So I'm spending quite a bit of my time at the moment trying to fundraise. Um, I have been quite very lucky. So EBED has given me money. Um, the WBF has given me a small bit of money. So has the EBL given me a small pot of money. So my next um, door that I should be knocking on will be uh, the ACBL and the Educational Foundation because mm. I think it's only right that the uh, North Americans get involved in this too. We don't want to leave you out. Right. So I'm hopeful that they might chip in something too because at the moment I have enough money to pay um, a postdoc researcher for two days a week, but really I need to, someone to be working on it three days a week so that we can get this you know, to, we can get these publications finished and get the message out there that this is something um, worth taking note of. And I, I'm hoping that sort of the ultimate goal is that this will feed into shifting the image of Bridge and um, promoting the health and well-being aspects and, um, and, well, ultimately widening the participation and enhancing the sustainability of the game. Um, Do so, you have audio of all those interviews? Sorry. Do you have uh, do you have all those videos? Uh, I mean, all those interviews uh, recorded audio. Yes, I do, but uh, I do it differently from you. So um, I record them audio, audio in audio form, but then they get fully transcribed word for word. Yeah. So that is quite expensive to get a full transcript because yeah, 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 the, yeah, yeah. the interviews are on average are two hours long. Um, so there's a lot awful lot of data there, and then I send the full transcript to the interviewee so that they can check and they have full control over, um, you know, what they let me use. And I give them an option as well that they can be named um, for the bits that they're happy to share. Um, but I also want to explore, as a sociologist, I'm keen to explore the darker side of Bridge mm. and the bits that we're not always proud of and the negative emotions, the competitiveness, the some of the inequalities and the power um, dynamics that get played out not always in positive ways um, so understandably I want people to share that kind of side of the game with me um, but they might not want to put their name to it so I offer them anonymity um, right. certain bits as well so with that I hope to write different papers um, and different formats for different audiences to try and target um, you know potential players to the game and also to establish it as a as an academic field that can link to sociology of work, sociology of leisure, sociology of sports, link to other mind sports. Mm. Um, and if we present at academic conferences and get the word out there, then I think this will all help to shift the image of bridge as something um, quite different from what people think it is. Mm. So actually, I was just in conversations with the University of Stirling to set up a crowdfunder for me so that... Um, Hopefully, it will encourage people to make some donations that are tax effective that might might encourage them. Because even I can do a lot with small bits of money. The whole, all of this research got started a few years ago with just three hundred dollar donation that I had from one bridge player in Scotland, John Matheson, got me started. So wow. I can do a lot with small small pockets of money. Actually, what for me, what's great about sociology is it really makes us think about um, everything that we take for granted and all our assumptions. And it forces us to unpack those um, and to really question everything. And the wow. beauty for me of sociology is that it's all about complexity and nuance um, and about um, bringing together a range of perspectives and things. So, for example, gender inequalities and bridge. Um, I think we'd all have a view on that, a common sense view of that. But if you actually try and study it sociologically, um, it's really quite complex. Huh. Well, I mean, I'm certainly, as well as publishing formally, you know, in academic um, publications, um, I'll be posting regularly uh, on blog posts on Bridge Winners. Mm. Um, and it's already had an amazing um, global reaction. Um, it's been taken up, you know, I, I post small things, you know, via Facebook. So I'm always looking for more Bridge Facebook friends. And we've also set up a new Twitter account for the sociology of Bridge. Mm. So I'd encourage people to follow, follow that because um, I hope that that will grow. Um, and social media is, you know, it's gone a bit mad in terms of the research because one of the posts, because it, 
there was a press release about our new university bridge club and about the new PhD. Um, and there was a press release that it went to the national papers in Scotland, but it got picked up by New Zealand Bridge. Um, and they shared it on their Facebook page, New Zealand Bridge, and it's had over 470 shares wow. and over 32,000 hits um, from all over the world. So, um, and, and then they invited me to do a piece, as you heard, on their podcast um, for their radio show um, called The Bridge Zone. I think that's quite a unique thing. I've never heard of of any country having a, a half hour a show dedicated to bridge every week right. um so um i think you know th that's another innovative idea of how you start to reach out to more people and make bridge more accessible by having a bridge program on the radio so um yeah i think there's there's all sorts of innovative possibilities and i'm really hoping that given the reaction i've had from across the world um that the sort of the next step would be to develop more global partnerships and collaborations and to really put together a big interdisciplinary project um, mm. that looks at, at promoting the game um, from a range of different aspects. Um, so I'm kind of hoping that that would be, that would be the follow on step once we've established the field and got the credibility and the expertise um, to take it further. What is your, so if any, it, sorry, what is your primary, like, like you're a sociologist, I didn't I didn't think to look up your uh, your academic background in right. the in the research that I did for this interview. What is I mean? What is your like? Uh, are you teaching courses right now? Like what what are you? Uh... Well, my my sort of uh, key key interests for the past twenty years have been the sociology of childhood, youth, and families. Mm. Uh, so I've done a lot of work, particularly on children's work in. Um, developing countries, mm. um, Latin America and Asia. Um, but I've also looked at um, uh, intergenerational relationships in Scotland in different, in different fields. So all of this does tie in quite nicely to the bridge research because I have, you know, that ambition to put that knowledge of sociology of childhood, youth and families and bring that to the bridge arena and look at, well, then how can we get more bridge into schools and more young people playing and develop the kind of intergenerational family approaches so although it seems like I'm changing direction in terms of my academic research um they actually it actually complements quite nicely what I've done before mm. up until now so um, when do you I mean like do you bring up bridge in your classes or um not yet because as I say it's not well I suppose yeah to be no to be fair I do I do but in small ways but because it's not an established field and because at the moment there aren't there's nothing published sociologically about mm. bridge there is in other fields um there's some in psychology there's some in other disciplines mm. but in sociology as I said it doesn't exist so that's what I'm trying to do gotcha. at the moment is to just make sure we get these papers out um I have a great team of uh, PhD researchers that I work with but you know very talented um, researchers in their own right who they bring a really fresh perspective because there's the problem that as I'm an insider and a player myself and mm. um, I can be sometimes too close to it and sure. it's great to be working with people that don't play that can bring that outside a perspective and um, yeah and can challenge me on some of my thinking mm. um, so it works yeah it works well I, and th I think there's lots of possibilities and it's all very exciting to be establishing something quite new mm. in academia going back to what you said about being too close to it i found i started playing chess recently and i'm a very much a, a beginning chess player for the um i mean i just beginnings maybe not the right but i'm very much a uh I'm trying to think of a word for a poor chess player uh <laughs> but i'm not very good at chess and it what it the amazing thing is what it's done is I make so many elementary errors in chess, but I can't really I I can it has helped me see how many uh, sort of small errors I make in bridge that I wouldn't have been able to see without playing chess because I'm too close to bridge like I'm too focused on results like I don't see like oh my gosh how could I play this card or that card or or what have you so I found it to be to be helpful to have that sort of perspective of like a mind game but not bridge in terms of becoming a better bridge player yeah that's interesting and I mean I think that's something that in terms of the research we need to do is to look at the current literature that exists for chess and for poker and um, for other kinds of um, mind sports 
Um, Because I think there's, you know, there's things that we could learn from what's written there. And there's a really good book written by a sociologist that looks at um, the chess community. Um, I guess one of my ambitions is to do the similar thing Mm. and write a a book looking at how the bridge world works Mm. from a sociological point of view. Mm. And, And for me, you know, as a sociologist, I'm interested in everything about the bridge world, about what happens before people get to the table, at the table, and then after play. Mm. Um, and all the dynamics and the workings of that. And yeah, so I find it fascinating and hope, hopefully others will too. Um, but there's also a very serious kind of um, benefit to it all as well around, um, as I said before, about widening participation and, and in, improving the inclusivity of the game, mm. I think. I think there's things that we could do, small things that we could do to raise awareness around how we could be more welcoming to certain groups. Yeah, um, I definitely hear you on that one. (laughs) Sometimes it's easy. Like sometimes I'm so determined to get a good result that I I don't necessarily. Anyway, I'm not I'm not the most welcoming uh, person. Greg Hinsey said something funny to me during the open pairs qualifying at or in Orlando. He came out between rounds. And he said it's funny because like we're everybody here loves bridge like that's sort of a given, but nobody is smiling. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, I think we can all be guilty sometimes of being in the bridge bubble when we don't mean to be rude, but we can really come across that way to somebody else. And as a sociologist, that's something that I'm interested in is the sort of unintended behaviors and the unintended consequences of some of the things that bridge players get up to Mm. i'm reading a really i just started reading a really good book it's called the 15 commitments of conscious leadership and Mm. frankly i i don't think it's a great title but the book itself is really fascinating and it's helped me see uh how so it, it it refers to a concept Early on in the book, it talks about being above or below the line. And it says if you're above the line, you are open and you are curious and you're in a learning framework and uh, you're non judgmental. And if you're below the line, you're closed, you're uh, guarded, you're protecting yourself, you're, you're focused on the need to be right. And it's it's an interesting framework because I was I had dinner with my sister last night and I noticed that I was like below the line a lot. Like I was like very much sort of locked in on a fixed perspective of her. And uh, I don't know that it's a sociology book, but I found it to be I'm, I'm finding it to have application um, in my own life and probably applies well to bridge in terms of you know, like being, you know, like, like maybe if we go back to the example that, that, that you had earlier with, with Steven, like about not uh, playing the right card. Um, it's like the, like maybe you were below the line in that sense, in that instance, like you weren't curious, you know, maybe, maybe there was a reason, like maybe there's a reason why he played that card. Like it's interesting to try to, to try to be curious in those instances instead of, uh, instead of con- condemning. Yeah, yeah, and yeah, and understanding, I suppose, what leads us to do these daft things. I mean, that's something that I've asked all my interviewees, you know, as, you know, why, why do we all make these careless errors at times? Because we all do, um, even at the top. So, um, and it's about, yeah, understanding what, what is it about us that's led us to, to do something that... Is there a consensus that, answer? Is there a consensus answer for that? No, no, there's a range of different, you know, um, there's some practical things like being a bit distracted, like having something else in your mind, like not sleeping well, um, yeah, the emotions that are getting in the way. Um, and then they're just kind of, yeah, it's just sometimes it is a bit inexplicable and it's hard to pinpoint. Why is it? Why did you just say, you know, call for the diamond instead of say the eight of diamonds, you know? So, yeah, you know, you know, and I've done it myself. I did it myself. 
um, to be fair, I did yeah. it myself in Orlando when I'd worked out what I was going to do. And then I, yeah, I did it myself and, and had a plan and then changed it at the last minute. And that's, that's not quite the same, but very similar. It's like I changed my plan at the last minute. Why? I knew what I was going to do. So, you know, and I suppose sometimes we just don't take time to double check something before we do it. It's all part of, you know, the focus and concentration, which is so key to bridge, which um, I didn't used to understand. I used to think, well, how, how can it be so hard to concentrate? You know, <laughs> concentrating, you know, there's all these other things that you need to do, squeezes and end plays and, and you know, throw-ins and all the rest of it. How can concentrating be so hard? But, you know, it's that sustained concentration for hours and, and even days on end that, yeah, that is, I suppose, more difficult than it might seem at first glance. Like and that's I, where the pros get their edge, I guess. I'd be interested to know if, if like, like how do you recover from disastrous errors? Like, for example, I played in a Swiss teams in a sectional here in Virginia on Sunday, and my partner led the ace of hearts against a 2-0, uh, three clubs, three diamonds, 3-0 no, uh, auction. And dummy had king, 10, fifth of hearts, and I had queen, fourth. And my partner led the ace, and she now played a, a low heart. So literally, like, I know, like, that Declara has jack and one. But for some reason, I only thought that I didn't realize that they're, like, like literally at trick two, I had seen all 13 hearts. And I needed to win the queen of hearts. Dummy didn't have any entries. And it they didn't. Oh, my God. It's just, like. Like it's it's the kind of error where it's like it's it's so elementary, but it was the difference between them making and not make. If so, sorry, Declare played low, so I had to win the Queen of Hearts. But for some reason, I thought that there was a there was one more heart, a thirteenth heart missing, uh, like a not the Jack, but I was I literally spent the whole hand thinking like who has the thirteenth heart when I was discarding uh, from my hand. And it's just like, I don't know. Is that a question that you ask? Like, how do you recover from just like disaster, like disaster, like just horror? I mean, was that is that part of your research? Yeah, and I mean, I think what's interesting about the bridge world is that there's a complete diverse range of players and diverse characters. So some might burst out laughing and find it funny. Um, you know, and that in itself, can, humor can be a coping strategy. Right. Um, uh, you know, others struggle with it. Others, you know, um, so the, the, uh, you know, others do basic practical things like get a glass of water or, you know, go to the toilet, take a break, um, those kinds of things. Some might even have a mantra that they say to themselves. Um, I know um, a Jeff Mextroff actually said, yeah, he used to say, um, you know, if he has done something and he's given some imps away that he shouldn't have given, he just says to himself that, right, that's it. They're not getting any more. You know, he tightens his resolve and he says that, that's it. You know, no more imps for them. <laughs> I'll tighten my game. So, you know, that, that stuck with me. It's just like just making sure that that's the last really stupid thing you do and that's it. Well, you know what? I'm now I'm even thinking, I wonder if they can still make it if I win the Queen of Hearts. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that would be really sweet if they could still make it. Um, man, that would make me feel a lot better. <laughs> but, and there is that, there, there's that thing too as well, is that when, um, say, you know, you're frustrated because, you know, partner you think is, from your perception, partner's not followed your line of defense and they've, they've made a stupid switch and you're so cross at the stupid switch that you then go, Mr., you know, misdefend the hand yourself and it's actually the the last person that makes the mistake is is the person with the biggest amount of blame because you just let yourself get cross and irritated mm. instead of concentrating on how to recover oh. all right i have to think about this hand <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh huh. but i think for me all this shows is that we're human and bridge is a human game and it's about you know for me that's what attracts me as a sociologist to, to have it as a, a field of study is because it is about the social connection that's made through bridge and the human aspect of it. It's not, 
you know, there is a technical side to the game, but the non-technical side of the game and the social networks that are involved, Bridge is a partnership game, a team game, the Bridge world is a community. Um, now we have the problem of the Bridge world being a sustainable community and the question marks surrounding that. So, so for me, it just, it, it, it can be like a microcosm of society. And that's what makes it fascinating sociologically to study it because there's no easy answers to any of this, I don't think. Mm. Um, and I'm, I'm very lucky that I'm, I'm working at a university that's very open to me, you know, doing this because, you know, I, I, from, from their perspective, it could be seen as a risk that, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm established in the sociology of childhood field and I'm now leaving that behind and trying to establish the sociology of bridge, mm. which, you know, it's a card game. It's a mind sport. Um, not all universities would em- maybe embrace that and allow me to give my time to that. So I'm very lucky that it fits with our University of Stirling's research mm. themes here, living well, um, because they have they have a real interest in healthy aging. So I think I'm quite fortunate that I've been able to combine work and play in, in this kind of environment. Well, I think I think that I think that what you're doing. I mean, from I'm granted, I'm not a university administrator, but I think what you're doing makes so much sense. Like the fact that you you are established as a sociologist, you have a thorough, deep understanding of of a aspect of sociology. But now to be able to apply that that uh, set of knowledge to this game you love, it just make it, like it just makes so much sense. Um, I mean, yeah, I think it's, I think it's like a totally natural like thing. And even if Sterling weren't endorsing it, you could probably find a, like, it sounds like they are forward thinking, but if, if that, if that's not always the case there, I, I imagine that there's, I mean, the last thing that like academic, I think academics get a bad reputation sometimes for sort of resting on their laurels, you know, like the fact that you're wanting to introduce a whole new field. That's, uh, that's, that's fantastic. But, and I suppose as well, cause, cause they've got this interest in living well. And as I've talked about just there, it's about bridges sort of ideal because it's looking at the social connections that enable us to live well, because I think there's been a lot of research up till now that shows that, um, social connection is the most important factor in healthy aging. So you're more likely to live longer if you have good social connections, mm. more so than exercise right. or even more than a healthy diet or, or even more than not smoking. Social oh. networks, being part of a, a good community and having those social connections mean that you're more likely to, to live into older age. So mm. I think, you know, there is, as well as being, you know, sociologically interesting in its own for its own sake, you know, it does actually fit into right. well, how can people live longer? So that's the message that we need to get out is if you take up bridge, your social connections will be enhanced and this will enable you to live to live longer and healthier. So and it and it fits with um, brain fitness too. I mean it's it's got the cognitive aspect as well as the social aspect and brain fitness and keeping keeping alert and and they you know there's links to hopefully um, bridge delaying the onset of dementia. We're still yet to completely prove that, but so, yeah, so I think there is, there's good impacts of the research. Um, so I'm, you know, as a sociologist, I've said before, um, I'm interested not just in the usefulness of it, but also in just understanding the dynamics of the bridge world for, for its own sake as being something sociologically interesting. You know, that's my view, but I don't know if everybody else sees it that way. But it's easy to get um, excited when you're passionate about a topic. Well, I mean, I think that that's one reason why I like to play bridge here in Charlottesville is because I like the community aspect of it. Um, yeah. Yeah, I like what you said in one of your earlier podcasts about the importance of personal connections, I think you talked about, and nurturing new players. Because um, I think that's something that we do need to do more work on and sort of nurturing the players, supporting their transitions, supporting them not only just into the game, but as I said before, with the PhD, transiting through the game, going from learning it to club to tournaments. Um, so that that nurturing is not just at the start as nurturing a new player, but it's nurturing them through that bridge journey. Mm. So I don't know about you, but that's how I got into the game. You know, it was through people 
leading me through it. Do you know what I mean? Because I played for the first year or so, just once a week on a beginner's night in the local, you know, in the local Sterling Bridge Club. And it wasn't until someone said, have you thought about going to, you know, a congress, the equivalent of your sectionals? And I was like, no, why would I want to do that? Why would I want to play bridge all weekend? That sounds a bit strange. <laughs> But, you know, they said, no, no, it's fun, you know, and they set it up, they organized it all, they took me, they organized a partner and teammates, and, of course, I came away from that weekend going, oh, why wouldn't you want to do that right. rather than why did you do that? So, right. But that requires mentors and, and, and nurturers and yeah. volunteers to support those transitions, and I think that's, yeah, and that's what you're doing with the film. So I don't think you should be at all disheartened by the film. Look what you've already achieved. Look what you've achieved. You enabled us to achieve in Scotland through the film. Mm. Well, I appreciate your saying that. I, I took one of my... I'm, I'm teaching a bridge class. at. It's called Common House here in Charlottesville. I teach it once a month. And one of my students from that, we played in our, his first sectional this weekend. And we started out with a... <laughs> well, on the second hand, I played in a cubit <laughs> of the opponent's suit. Of the opponent's suit. <laughs> uh, we had like a thirty-seven percent in the uh, in the morning session, and and it was two. It's two sessions, so there was a lunch break. And at the end of the session, he said, "Okay, well, that you know, thank you, I appreciate it." And it was kind of like he was kind of intimating that he wasn't planning on his plans were not to play in the afternoon session. But my plans all along were to play in the afternoon session. And, but at, the, at this point, just disheartened by the by our results, I was sort of like, OK, uh, you know, let's go have lunch. And then I was going to maybe not just, you know, just not bring it up. But we went to lunch and we were talking about some of the hands and what have you. And I was like. You know, I'm happy to play in the afternoon session. And he was like, really? And so he was like, okay, let's do it. So we did a lot better. We, well, we did 10% better. We, did, we were 47%. But it's, it's uh, I mean, yeah. It's tough. <laughs> it's tough. Yeah, I think for competitive bridge animals, it's it's hard to play when there's nothing at stake. So when you have started so disastrously, it can be hard to get the motivation to continue. Mm. Yeah, plus I, di I didn't really know, like, I didn't know what, like, there was a there was this auction later where I, I could have cubid, but I was a little, I was a little gun shy on, like, bringing out my, uh, my full my full game. I didn't really know how to, uh, I didn't know how to play. So it, it's a, it was a, it was an interesting challenge. How, how do I, how do I get the most out of, uh, out of our partnership? Yeah. So I suppose you shifted your goal. So and that gave you a new, a new thing to aim for. Yeah. But I think my goal, like I, you know, like I try to go, I do try to go into these bridge, like any sort of, competitive endeavor I tried my my goal like it's called a playing focus is how I think of it and I my goal is like to be joyful like to have a good time and that gets thrown I feel like that gets put by the wayside so quickly <laughs> <laughs> well, it's nice to have the good intention <laughs> yeah but it's one thing to like say it it's another thing to do it yeah but that that happens time and time again at Bridge, doesn't it? That's what we've talked about a lot of, you know. You know, I, I, I'm actually starting to play, I've started to play Hearts again recently, and I'm really enjoying it. And it's like, like Bridge, I'm not even sure, I don't even know that I enjoy it. I mean, I love it, like, but I'm so competitive and I'm so result-focused on it. It's like, I don't know, I think I need to play like, I'm trying to get on this Barbu website, but I can't get my Mac to to get the thing to work. So um, I don't know. Bridge is like really hard. It's I mean I really I want to be like the best in the world, and I'm very far from that. So um, yeah, that's what I have to say. But about that. you know, having said all that, it's still the best game in the world. So. For me, it's ruined all other games. I don't really want to play any other games. So. Mm. 
Uh, well, yeah. I don't know what to say. See, like you have you have good you have good established partnerships. I don't really have an established uh, partnership. I'm a client, so I pay. I like to play with good mm-hmm. players, so I have to pay them to play with me generally. So uh, I just it, it's just a little like suboptimal. In what sense? Uh, in the sense that. Uh, like I don't have a regular and and I don't have a regular time. Like when I go on bridge base lately, I'm mostly playing in the robot tournaments, and that's fine. But it's not really bridge. Um, it's kind of like a you know you have the best hand, and I'm not so emotionally involved in it that I'm like I might quit after a couple boards if I get a bad result. Um, it's just it's just not the same. Like I, I, I need that. I need a partner, you know, like I need a, a, a good partner for me. And, uh, it's, mm. it's a financial burden to that. At least that's the way I have it set up right now is that if I'm going to play with a good partner, I, a lot of times I have to pay them to play with me. Mm. That's another sociologically interesting area, the whole professionalization of the game and how it's changed the game and the pros and cons attached to that. So. Yeah, I remember you said something to me about that in Lyon. Uh, something about uh, I forget. I forget what you said exactly. I was slightly offended. You were offended, were you? I said I was slightly offended. Yeah, <laughs> it was something about being a client. I forget. Uh, I forget what you said. Oh dear. I think it was at the banquet. I'm sure it was an unintended offensive remark. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you've more than made up for it. So uh, <laughs> I wish you could remember what it was. It was something about like the burden of like paying people to play. I think like or like like. Is it not like? Do you still feel you deserve to win if you're paying your partner or your teammates? Yeah, I, I don't know if it was that. I don't know if it was that precisely. Um, but it was something about like uh, being a client and. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't exactly remember. Well, I'm still, you know, I'm really interested in those dynamics between pros and clients. And as part of the interviews, you know, I've I've asked people about that and I've interviewed um, some clients as well. So, um, yeah, maybe one day we get to turn the tables and I'll interview you. Well, I'll say that as a client, like you sort of, like one of the things that I don't, um, let's see. Like you don't, you, it's, it's easy as the client to sort of not take responsibility for your results because uh. you are paying the other people and who would they, who are they to complain about it if you're paying them? And I think that's a very, like, that's a place that I wasn't consciously aware that I was in, um, mm. as a client, but that was definitely a, a place that I that I, that I that I have that I, I have occupied, and there was a hand. So in the round of sixteen of the mixed teams, uh, we were on the last board of the set, and I was in against a. We were defending a note three no Trump contract, and I had to make a play, and my partner had discarded high club, saying she didn't like clubs, and. I just had to make a passive exit, really. I mean, it was really not that hard, but I thought about it for a long time. And I I knew a lot about Declare's hand because of the I'd led a heart, and my partner had played the queen, so I knew Declare had the jack of hearts, and I had the ten, so I couldn't play hearts. Anyway, we got the defense right, and we beat 3 no Trump. And I we came out, and my teammates were watching it on ViewGraph, And it was just like so satisfying to have made the right defense because there's so many hands that I did the wrong thing on during the tournament to actually do the right thing. And not only that, but to have my all like the entire rest of the team watching like that was really cool. Mm -hmm. So 
I think as a client, like my goal is as a client is not to consider myself, not, not to, not to use that like power, uh, dynamic, like not to, not to hide behind that power dynamic, I, I, I suppose is what I mean to say. Like, I want to hold myself to a higher standard and I hate it when I, like I did some really like, I didn't bid a game. Like I had just like the clearest game bid and it's a vulnerable game in the round of 64 match of the open. And like, you know, it's just, it's anyway. Yeah. And it's, it's, as you say, it's an interesting dynamic. Um, yeah. Quite tricky one. I'd imagine at times. Yeah. You're going to find out about it when you're on this team with Zia and Bob and, uh, and the whole crew. So you're going to set that up for me then? Is that, <laughs> is that my paycheck for doing this? Podcast? Yeah, you'll have to give me, uh, you'll have to send me your bank details and uh, I'll put some email out, emails out to the, to the group and uh, see what we can do. You know, might as well. Great, I look forward to it. <laughs> Who's the guy that you play with, uh, the English? He's, you, you referred to him on the, the New Zealand podcast as like your uh, bridge mentor. I think his name is Mike Reese. Tim Reese, he Tim plays Reese. Uh, for Wales. Can you tell me about uh, Can you tell me about that relationship? Um, yeah, I mean that just happened by chance. He had a friend in Scotland, and he came up to play in, in one of our congresses. Um, and they hadn't played together for years, so he was just coming up and having a friendly game. And they were looking for teammates, and this was when I was like post beginner. Um, I hadn't been playing very long at all, but I was asking, as I said, I went through this phase of asking lots of questions mm. all the time. So we got paired up with them. That was with my first bridge partner, um, Diana, um, who, uh, you know, she went on to work in Kazakhstan and everyone was th thought it was because she couldn't cope with my bidding anymore. <laughs> she, had, she had to leave the country. Um, but we got paired up with um, Tim and Jenny, and I just spent a whole weekend bombarding him with questions. And I think he kind of enjoyed that sort of status of being the teacher, right. and, you know, me wanting to sort of learn from all of his experience. And as he's often sort of said, it's, you know, when you're learning, it's, it's very helpful. If you, if, you know, I could ask, he'd been playing for 40 years at the time. So if I could ask loads of questions I could benefit it's like reading a book you right, know you can yeah. accelerate your learning either through reading a book or for, through asking a very experienced player how they would cope with certain situations and what they would do and what their thinking is behind a bid or a play or mm. or a defense so um yeah so and he I suppose he enjoyed that being in that position of being the teacher and me um you know wanting to learn and get better so it, it happened from there I think afterwards he, he stupidly offered that I could continue asking him questions by email and uh, I, I didn't need any encouragement, so he got, really? a, lot of emails. <laughs> he got a lot of emails. Huh. And I mean, cool. you know, that, yeah, that, that was a great learning opportunity for me. So, and, and then, you know, we went, we went through a period where, you know, I, I was just asking him loads of questions and then he, we had the old game together um, and over the years I've got better and we've actually been able to play a bit more as a, a slightly more more equal partnership. Yeah. Um, but, you know, because, yeah, I mean, yeah, it, the, the, the dynamic changes as, you know, um, right. through right. time. The sort of dream is to have more PhD students come here and study different aspects of bridge and um, develop more interdisciplinary projects. So mm. the more that the word can get out that this is happening and develop more collaborations and get ideas and feedback as well. I want, yeah, I mean, that's something that um, I'd welcome that if anybody has any suggestions of things to be researched or, gotcha. you know, um, feedback on what we're doing or things that they think would be helpful to explore in the future, then I'd be really open to that. So. Okay. All right, I'll, I'll make sure that's in there. Okay. <laughs> All right, thanks so much, Sam. It's good talking to you. Tell yeah. Stephen I said yes. hello. I really appreciate Sam coming on the podcast with me. And she also was the first person to screen, the first bridge player to screen Double Dummy in her at the University of Sterling. 
and it was some of the outcomes that she shared on the on the show today really are um, it's exciting for me as a filmmaker to have been able to be a part of that and we've got another screening coming up uh, Civi Silicon Valley Youth Bridge is hosting a screening on January 15th at 7:30 you can uh, find tickets to that on tug if you searched under tug double dummy t u g g and then we've got a couple other screenings potentially in the works um, in different parts of the country. We would love, if you are interested in doing a screening, please reach out to me. Um, we really want to share this film with uh, the next generation of bridge players. Bridge is a great way to bring people together in intergenerationally in families. And uh, we're excited that people like Sam are helping us to accomplish that mission. So uh, please, please do consider it, and thanks for listening. And one final thing, thank you for your patience and waiting for this episode. I know I've been inconsistent in having a time frame for putting out episodes. Um, maybe that's a New Year's resolution I can work on. Uh, thanks.